The Witch is a New England folktale by director Robert Eggers who sets out to make what may be considered a new horror classic that goes against the mainstream being short on jump scares and more on the artsy side. From early quotes calling it a demon-possessed Terrence Malick film to others saying that it feels like something you shouldn't be watching, it really starts to build it up because the latter one makes it sound like you can end up in jail or scarred for life. Now while I first want to cover the non-spoiler stuff that I believe are crucial to know before and after watching the film, you can jump right here to this timestamp where I will be talking about the spoiler heavy stuff and the themes and how I perceive them. But let's start breaking it down. For those of you who don't know, the story of the film follows a devout Christian family that gets banished from their town when the father confronts the leaders for not following God correctly. Obviously, they're not having that. So the family then relocates near the outskirts of a forest where a sinister presence is watching them. Now, know that this movie does have those horror elements, but it is just as much an accurate historical piece that then dives into being a family drama. And like I said in the beginning, it's definitely an artsy film where a lot of people will go into it and say, yeah, this is really slow, but that ending really intensified things. Other people will love the subtlety in the beginning and then think the ending gets too out of hand. I love the subtlety and I thought the ending intensified it. However, I know that some people are just going to avoid it because it deals with a witch. There's also the whole concept of the satanic church wanting to sponsor this movie. And I say that for me, yeah, I'd run away from this movie as fast as I could until I researched it a bit more and realized that the story is just as much a suspense film about one's faith in God that actually does it better than most Christian movies do. Looking into the first time feature film director Robert Eggers, we see why this film works so well. Having earned his dues as a production designer, art director, prop stylist, and heck, even a set carpenter, he approached this project determined to make what he envisioned and also break the number one rule in film school. Don't film with animals, kids, or near water. He said, screw it. But what he achieves is an atmosphere similar to that of recent Ben Wheatley films. It's sort of like a domestic version of The Crucible and even hits the right chords that people are calling him Kubrick-esque. And I'd say that, yeah, because just like The Shining, this thing plays like a nightmare. It also has meticulous design. And the way he directs the three little kids in this movie speaks volumes to how he did not traumatize them for life. Eggers also stands out as a filmmaker who doesn't just rely on Wikipedia for his facts or rely on somebody else to get them. The man spent five years just researching this movie. You even see it in the quotes that he has and where he says, I read everything from Puritan prayer manuals and real accounts of witchcrafts. I read the Geneva Bible from beginning to end. And you can see it in this movie looking at the way that he has his actors speak in Old English that may be a little hard to understand at first, but then becomes eerie when you realize that what they're saying, a lot of it comes from real life journals and transcripts of that time. You then get absorbed even more with the setting that they have because they made this farm from scratch. They build it all the way to the top, but not just that, it's a fully functional farm where the actors were even taught how to grow crops so you actually feel like it's real. On top of that, Eggers altered the camera so the aspect ratio was a little bit taller, thus being able to fit in all the trees, thus you having that very eerie feeling when you're watching it because he designed it so you're absorbed into this world and just completely freaked out. Add to the mix the eerie score of strings and core voices by Mark Corvin, who did the indie cult cube, and you're completely absorbed into this dark world. It's no wonder Eggers has been chosen to direct the Nosferatu remake. But let's get into the spoilers now, which again, Again, if you haven't seen the movie, I say go check it out, make your own opinion about it. Know that it definitely has those religious sides to it, but it also has those horror sides to it. Know that it's slow, but has this very intense ending at the end. But we're going to talk about the themes and everything else that deals with spoilers, so you have been warned. And I'm going to break it down into three parts, which is going to be the summary of the movie, and then the themes, and then the witch. So let's start off with that summary. Now we see in the beginning, like I said, that the family is being banished into the woods when the father calls out the leaders of the town. As they settle in their new farm, Thomas and the eldest daughter is asked to watch Samuel, the newborn, where as you see in the trailer, she ends up losing him to the witch. Right away though, you see what happens to Samuel. The witch takes him back to her home within the woods where she kills him, rubs his blood all over him, and eats him. Very nice stuff. The mother Catherine becomes very hostile towards Thomason after this. She blames her for Samuel's disappearance. The father William and the eldest son Caleb venture into the woods in secret to try to capture the wolf they believe did this but are unsuccessful. Meanwhile, the twins Jonas and Mercy, which of course adds to the shining light creepiness, constantly play with the black horned goat named Black Philip. They also are always playing tricks on Thomason throughout, so when Mercy tells her that she saw Samuel get taken into the woods by a witch, Thomason doesn't believe 
believe her and instead tells her that she herself is a witch just to scare her and make her stop telling lies. As the family starts to suffer from a drought in crops, we see the family start to deteriorate as well. Thomason struggles with her growing adolescence and guilt she carries. Caleb starts to notice his sister's physical appearance. William admits to his pride and the mother is just taken away. When Thomason discovers what Caleb and Williams were doing in the woods, she asks him to take her out to the trap. In the woods, Caleb and Thomason end up getting lost when a small rabbit scares off their horse and dog. Caleb runs after the dog while Thomason gets knocked out after falling off the horse. When she awakes, she is able to find her way back home while Caleb discovers the witch's house where she seduces him as a young temptress. Once again, Thomason is blamed for Caleb's disappearance until Caleb returns naked and very sick during a storm. Mercy calls out Thomason for calling her a witch, to which Thomason explains, yo, I, I was just only doing that so she can stop lying about all the things she was saying. Caleb ends up dying and William decides to lock up the three remaining children in the animal shed, believing one of them to be the reason behind all of this. While being locked up, the witch appears in the shed in the middle of the night and kidnaps the twins, leaving Thomason behind. When William discovers her the next morning, he is suddenly rammed to death by the horned goat as Thomason watches in horror. Catherine then attacks Thomason out of despair and Thomason, in self-defense, is forced to kill her mother. As the only survivor, Thomason returns to the animal shed and demands the goat to speak. He makes her sign a deal and Thomason goes off naked into the woods to join a coven of witches that have been living there all along. Of course, amidst all of that crazy stuff, you also have scenes like the blood milk, you have the goat doing other crazier stuff, and one of the worst scenes with the raven that you'll ever see ever. But that summary only leads us to the interpretation of the movie and its themes, whether you side with the supernatural or the metaphorical, whether you side with the good or the evil. And the interesting part is that Eggers makes it completely open for interpretation over and over again in his interviews, where he doesn't want one concrete answer, but he wants you to figure it out for yourself. And I'd say that he does an amazing job, even better than recent films that leave things up to interpretation, like The Babadook, It Follows, and even Goodnight Mommy, because some of those are able to leave it for the audience to interpret, but many things that the audience interpret can also be clashed with what we see in the film, thus not really leaving it up into interpretation for the audience. This film, however, does something completely different. Because it's not teasing you on whether the witch is there or not. There is a witch. You see her right from the beginning and it's a genius move, thus allowing the audience to go, okay, I don't have to worry about whether I'm gonna be played or not. Instead, it leaves the consequences up into interpretation for yourself, whether you believe the supernatural elements of it and you believe that the witches were real and that their powers are what caused all of the bad things to happen to the family, that the goat was clearly the devil who was living with them, made her sign the contract at the end, and that the witches were tormenting them either because they were looking forward to taking Thomas as their own or you know they just intruded in their land and for those who want that you definitely get that 100% and all of its creepiness but for me I saw it more so as a family drama where they were losing their religion and I not only think that the movie makes that clear but you can even see it with the actors interpretations and even what the editor has to say I, I just put it like a regular drama honestly I treated it like a a non-horror film. It builds up into this paranoia of this family that ends up becoming like a domestic version of Clue at a certain point where they just don't know what to do. They are cooped up in this place away from society. They're living in a time where not only bad things were happening to them that they couldn't explain because of the weather, but also where everything was just being blamed on witches. So by the end of all these crazy events that came out of paranoia, Thomason has no choice but to join these coven of witches, which are other outcasts who were living in the woods just like they were, because what is she gonna do? Live by herself go back to society where they're gonna call her a witch as well she really has no choice there's also the viewpoint of men back then looking at women as witches or calling them witches because of the fear of feminism or women just being able to mature on their own thus that was their way of saying yeah women go back in the kitchen thus what you would be seeing here is the most jacked up coming of age story for Thomason by the end of the film however more sides for the religious aspect I believe are backed up with another short by Eggers titled the brothers which is his interpretation on the story of Cain and Abel He's even quoted saying, I can empathize with it and found a key into really loving these people. Even though their worldview is that the privilege of being the chosen people is horrible, they're still human beings with struggles. He knows that, hey, if I wanted to tell a religious story in this time, people would connect it with things that are going on today or they would just dismiss the story because they're like, that's way too personal and you're attacking me. And he knew that the only way to tell a religious story was to go back in time, which is why he even says, for me, it's easier to go to the sublime when you go to the past, when you go outside experiences. For me, that's cool. 
I'm not a Christian, but when you go into a cathedral, you are all of a sudden in a mythic time there. You are not in today. And honestly, sometimes to tell the best faith or religious stories is by someone who has that unbiased view, who can look at it and dissect it the way that Eggers is able to in this movie. And he does it phenomenally by presenting it in the genre of horror in a very clever way. John Carpenter once said, there are two different stories in horror internal and external. In external horror films, the evil comes from the outside, the other tribe, this thing in the darkness that we don't understand. Internal is the human heart. This film pretty much takes both sides and combines them, where if you go into the movie wanting to have that witch element, it's all there for you. You can follow that, or if you wanted to see it from the internal point where you can see that the evil was within them, the sins that they were committing, that that is why they were going through these consequences, you have that there as well, perfectly blended. Which is what leads us to what the witch represents. Is it just the evil spirit out there or is it the fears within us? We see in the movie that the fears that they had was the lack of faith for God, the pride, the lust, the fears of growing up, all of these different things that the characters were facing. As we said, even in those times, the fear came from men wanting to call women witches because they didn't want them to get the rights and mature the way that they were doing. And the irony is that to some extent, that's still happening today, which is why Edgar says that it's not a feministic film, but those ideals are obviously present. What we see in The Witch is despair. It's the things that we fear the most, the things that really get to our core, which is why in the most ingenious viral marketing campaign that they could do for a horror film, they let you put yourself in the place of the witch to exemplify that evil takes many forms. So the witch, it strives to bring out our internal fears, the things we can't control or the things we can't answer, and eventually may give false interpretation too. And that's what makes the witch so scary.